so we open up for discussion, questions. So, um, uh, Alan Rowe from uh, University of Warwick and UN Wider. Um, may I address this question to Steve? Uh, Steve, first of all, excellent, uh, very clear, um, level headed presentation, I think, about the pros and cons. Um, I just had one question about your views on the pipeline because you mentioned the uh, geopolitics of moving the Ugandan oil uh, through Kenya. Uh, but the decision now, as I understand it, is it will be moved down through Tanzania to uh, a port at Tanga. Um, but that process will involve going through uh, something like a hundred different districts of Tanzania, all of which will have some sort of say uh, on, on this happening and some involvement, I guess, in the problem you mentioned of uh, of heating at various intermediate points. It's also one of the most expensive investment projects that's ever been thought of in Africa, as I understand it. Could you just comment briefly on your own per perceived view about the reality of this pipeline? Thank you. Could we have a, a, yes, please. We take three questions and then hopefully they're equally distributed. We'll, we'll see. Thank you very much for the, the presenter. That was really interesting and very inform informative for hearing different exp experiences. Um, my small uh, observation again go back on the on the oil and gas and revenue mobilization in Uganda uh, by Steve Mugen. Uh, I just get interested to see how long the country has been waiting the export of oil and. Uh, some of the, the comments you have already mentioned, um, it's about how long people can wait and how this uh, have affected the economic position of Uganda. Because when you look at the time and probably look at the expectations, probably there are some investment in land expropriation uh, investment in the estate, as you mentioned, but all this again affect the the economic stability and the the planification. So, do you think that uh, this investment, let's say the investors who came to build the pipelines and who came to plan a land expropriation, do you think they will get the returns on what they are doing? Because the problem is they have already invested. And probably international air prices are changing, the expectation of the, the climate change and probably potential reduction in the oil use in, in the future. All these are going to affect all the plans for, th for the Uganda who have been waiting to use these natural resources. Do you think that there is an alternative for the Ugandans to probably cope with non-oil uh, non, uh, use in the future? Thanks. Okay, uh, Colin, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and uh, I'm from Uganda. My name is Joseph, and um, uh, you gave us a very good overview of what is really happening in Kampala and uh, Uganda concerning oil. Um, we are here in Norway, and uh, Norway is a very good case study for good practice in the, the oil sector. So what can Uganda learn from Norway? And what, what should we take and uh, probably improve our sector even before the oil flows? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, you have three questions to ask. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I, by the way, thanks so much. Seems that um, you are actually listening to what I was presenting. Yeah. I like the level-headed, uh, I don't quite know what it means, but it <laughs> probably means that I didn't overshoot in any, in any way. No, I, I very quickly, I think that um, the Total, Total e &P is, of course, a French company. Uh, it's quite interesting that uh, it's expanding so much social capital, but as well as financial capital in Uganda. So there's a whole lot of, what fascinates me is the dynamics of oil and what's happening uh, around Africa. For example, uh, ideally, uh, Total would be investing in West Africa, I would imagine. 
in the, the Malis and the Cote d'Ivoire of this world. But actually, they are diversifying from what is a, a completely terrible experience of French experience around that region. And they are looking at the French companies, are looking at Mozambican gas. They are actually trying to look at Tanzanian oil and so on. They are almost moving entirely from so another aspect of it. But anyway, going back very quickly, yes, oil seems to be going through, uh, the pipeline will go through extremely long, maybe it's over 1,000 miles and several, what would that be in kilometers? Um, as I said before, what is helping in the case of Tanzania is Tanzania owns land by the constitution. It can grab it, it can uh, from, so it's a much stronger position. It would have been much more difficult where the private sector, private ownership is much more entrenched in Kenya. Than, so that might help. But it's still going to be a logistical nightmare when you consider that uh, there are issues already in Uganda in terms of land allocation, land uh, where people have not been paid, or ghost households have been paid and the real ones have not been paid already, even before the oil starts flowing. So there are going to be challenges and issues. But I, I say the momentum, because it's taken off. There's no way you can do it halfway. It started, there's a lot of political commitment. I, I do feel that it will go on. Obviously, I mean, governments change. If a new government comes in, maybe, but as long as Museveni is leading that country, I think it will go on. He, he, he has invested so much in terms of social capital and political capital. Very quickly, um, yes, you are talking about the issue of what they call generally stranded assets. You build this whole, you know, white elephant, and then nothing really happens. So there is always that threat, because it's huge. These um, parts of, uh, of Uganda, you're transferring from Stone Age technologies, really, people that are living under very crude conditions to high-level technology, helicopters coming in, they're building out um, an international airport, so kind of putting those things together is going to be quite a challenge and uh, sort of uh, uh, putting pressure on a whole lot of people. Uh, very quickly, 100 years ago, there was a king called Kabariga of, around Hoima. So when he was taken prisoner, he reputedly said something like, everything has this time, he said many years ago. So people from that region are saying, yeah, you see? The man said everything at this time. This is our time now. So you can see everything is planned out. I don't know. Joseph, yes, thank you so much. What can Uganda learn from Norway? That is one example I sort of gave as a conclusion. I think I'll just give that one example. Norway says that uh, if you cannot use some of the oil preserve it for future generations, and just used to expand. I mean, in, in a way, Norway is very interesting. You come in, it's a normal Scandinavian country. I lived for a long time in, in Sweden with him, and it's not very different. And yet, this country is sitting on, use an African expression, is sitting on one trillion Point five dollars in terms of the resources that have come from oil. That could never happen today. In today's political economy in Africa, it could never happen. That this country has one trillion saved somewhere? No. They will want to spend it on whatever. You know, the Mercedes Benz for the president. It's not strong enough because there are a lot of bumps out, where, so on and so a helicopter for the president, so he can come, and so on and so forth. So the pressures are quite different. But obviously, Norway has had hundreds of years of political experimentation. It's a different kind of society. It's extremely homogeneous, uh, and of course, it's extremely in the Scandinavian abandon up there in the, you know, so it's not involved. It doesn't have all these dangerous neighborhoods that you have around Uganda. So it's not quite the same country. But definitely, uh, just learning that, uh, just spending on useless things 
is what this country has not done. Uh, it has been much more effective in using its resources. Thank you so much. Thanks. We do another round. Yes, please. Um, this is uh, directed to, to Etienne and Catherine. Um, it, what a fascinating couple of papers. I mean, it, 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 I was super excited and, and, and uh, mesmerized by, by the presentations. Um, I, I come from the EITI, and I, it's really uh, encouraging to see that the data is being used to, to do this analysis. But I also understand that there's a lack of data uh, to, to measure that. So I have two questions. The first one for Etienne. So wh what are the main sources of data in this uh, uh, really uh, scarce world of data? Are you, for example, measuring production vis-a-vis -vis exports and, and sales? And that's how you can have a, 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 a proxy of, of that uh, amount of, of losses, of, of revenue lost. Um, and of course, and, and that comes to the second question that, that's also directed to Catherine. Um, it's really encouraging to see, for example, that the, it's, it's Nigeria EITI, which is one of the largest secretariats and, 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 and uh, with a longer history of implementing the EITI that's actually producing this, this information. And it's really encouraging to see also that good data and good infrastructure can then increase demand for better analysis and better data as well. But so what are the lessons that, that you think we can learn to, to ha actually help the data for this kind of analysis being produced um, and we, we, we are very happy that we have a, now a new 2023 EITI standard that brings more information demand from the environmental side and stronger anti-corruption mechanisms also in the, public, in the, in the public, publicization of data. But we need to, to strengthen that further. So, yeah, any thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, we have one more at the back to the right. Okay, that was also one. Right, thank you. Uh, a question, another question to Etienne and, and Catherine here. I'm, I'm much more interested in minerals and metals, so I just would like to know, in your work, has you come, have you come across any similar approaches, Etienne, uh, when it comes to metals? Thank you, thank you so much to to the whole panel for your very, very interesting presentations. Uh, again, my name is Jan-Peter Holterdahl. I'm from NORAD, the Section for Governance and Transparency. Um, I'd like to comment on Steve's question from, from Uganda, but, but first maybe to mention that uh, we had a visit in NORAD uh, a year or two ago from, from Helen Clark, uh, the chair of EITI, uh, and she concluded uh, the whole discussion by saying governance is everything. <coughs> I think she has a very strong point. Um, and maybe that's what's been uh, a fortune for, for uh, Norway, but, but also I noted Steve's points on, on, on the delay uh, in oil production in Uganda, perhaps having been a, a blessing in disguise, because so much has been established, uh, at least th there's been quite a lot done in terms of establishing institutions, building expertise, etc. But just to share the super short version of the Norwegian history, if I may, and mainly as a, as not an, as, a, as an expert, but just as a Norwegian citizen, this is all, uh, is a shared history here in Norway. Uh, four things happened. One, um, uh, people with foresight uh, uh, worked very hard to establish the principle of, of how to share resources between countries and the midline principle ended up being uh, recognized as, as an international principle. Two, uh, we knew nothing about oil and gas production, nothing at all, and we were small. The big producers came in and we said to them, you teach us everything, absolutely everything. And we did, they, they, they taught us everything and we became experts. We, we weren't always experts. Three, very high tax levels established, uh, and four, uh, a consensus in Parliament that at the time, 70s, 80s, to establish a pension fund, which is now why we're uh, known as being stinking rich across the world, but we haven't always been, and there were reasons why we ended up in such a fortunate position. Uh, and it's not necessarily the case that only, only Norway 
uh, can do this. Uh, I remember I had the pleasure of visiting Zambia, Lusaka, the IGF, ATAF, uh, and the Zambia Revenue Authority conference back in June. Uh, and, and one of the examples of, of a country that had done the same, I think it was East Timor, that have actually established significant tax rates for, uh, uh, let's say, resource production in, in their country. So it's possible to uh, replicate or at least be inspired by other countries' experiences. That was too long. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this the insights of the Norwegian experience. So, I'll let the floor to you. Data and measurement is absolutely critical because uh, we need to know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, going on how do you take measures to, to, to act? And so, um, nowadays, using satellite measurements for emissions, that gives us global coverage and that gives us global reach and the resolution is improving very fast so that we now not only know that it's being emitted and how much is being emitted, but we also know who is emitting because the spatial resolution is there to do that. Certainly for gas flaring and for methane, we get very close to that and technology is improving by the year, so it's going very fast. For the illegal thefts uh, of oil, it's a little bit more complicated as you can imagine because uh, how do you spot oil being stolen? What can you do about it? But there are mechanisms that are being very effective uh, and, and that can be more widely used and implemented. So I, I'll, I'll mention a few. Um, one is the application of tracer testing. Uh, so um, oil companies in, in various countries, what they do if they have a problem with theft is they emit a tracer A at the origin where they produce and they emit a tracer B where the oil is being collated and say there's a pipeline in between. And so if oil comes on the market that has tracer A in it but not tracer B in it, you know that it has been stolen between A and B. So it's very clever, very simple. Uh, and nowadays with tracers in my report, I also think you can go much further. You can actually do designer tracers to really mark each parcel of oil uniquely. So if that parcel of oil turns up somewhere, you can actually trace its origins all the way where these tracers are being put in. And these tracers are invisible. You only know that they're there if you know what you're looking for. So, so technology in that sense is, is, is improving quite rapidly. The second one I would mention is metering. So Singapore is a great example. We know there's a lot of uh, fuel adulteration happening in Singapore maritime sector. So they decided as, a, as a, the, the MPA, the, the, the Port Authority, that only multi-phase flow meters could be used. And these are, well, were supposed to be sort of tempering proof. And as soon as that was introduced by the, by the government, we s saw the true extent of the amount of adulteration and, and mismanagement that, that, that happened before. And we could actually calculate on the basis of that how much fuel was actually lost before. Now people are getting smart and they start also to adulterate multi-phase <laughs> flow meters with magnets and all of that. But so the, the, it's always a, how do you say, a catching up um, process. And the third one I would mention on the metering is, again, satellites. Satellites, again, provide tremendous insights in bush refineries, for example, that I mentioned, which are uh, absolutely ecological, catastrophe, uh, and, and, and uh, certainly in, in, in certain countries, it's hundreds of thousands of barrels going to, to waste in the environment that way. You can spot that with, from satellite. The other area is maritime operations, ships uh, that... Um, uh, do illegal transfers or at sea, you can actually spot them by satellites. And again, the same satellite technology that we use for flaring can be used to track ships at sea, particularly uh, lights, but also radar systems and, and the likes are all traceable by satellites. And, and I think uh, when you see an aberration in terms of transponders being switched off, that kind of thing, immediately you should start focusing on what is happening here and take action and, and the response time can be much accelerated. So three different metering solutions and, and as I said, no golden um, bullet here, just uh, a mix of, of technologies that can help. Thanks, Eti, and thanks for all these great questions. Um, to the point about data and, um, and EITI and, and Nigeria EITI, 
One of the things that I think helped enormously in Nigeria was about two years ago, three years ago it must be now, they changed their data to actually report by asset until about, I think, 2019, all the reporting in the very good, by the way, EITI reports, which are all on the website, they were, by, um, they were aggregated for the most part. So you couldn't really then, as Etienne saying, pinpoint exactly which asset is, is flaring, which volumes and where, you know, who owns it, et cetera. So they changed that. Um, so that allowed us, when we did our analysis, to compare, so they were doing that as a basis for establishing penalties because the government again has penalties in Nigeria. Three or four years prior to that, they'd raised the level of the penalties to a more meaningful. So that these these you know sums were going from something like 15 million for all companies the last year under the old to about 250 million. I can't quite. It was that sort of order when they started to charge a more realistic level. But importantly, we were then able to look at the value of the gas on those assets that were reporting the penalties. And what we would find a big discrepancy between that penalty level that the government had set did not in fact reflect the value of the wasted gas. So again, from a regulator point of view, this independent satellite data can act, because it's providing you with actual volumes and you can look at, you know, the prices and prices obviously vary, but the, the difference is quite significant. So what it tells you is that penalties are good, but they may not actually reflect the value of the wasted gas, which again comes back to the government revenues being lost you know, as part, they're not going to get all, but as, as part of that. So I think that's, that's a really, really important point. And I mean, to, to Magnus, anything being done in, in metals, I mean, in my previous iteration at ICMM working uh, on metals, we had a whole program, Partnerships for Development, which was focused on precisely this public-private collaboration. I mean, the issues are somewhat different, but not necessarily that different in the mining sector. But we would have, again, multi-stakeholder workshops to debate the evidence that had been generated from a toolkit which had been developed by Oxford Policy Management and others. So, so I think this model of collaboration, I mean, really, these big, big challenging world problems, we, we cannot just have regulation. We cannot just have transparency. We need these different elements to be working together you know, they all got a role to play, going back to the point about the importance of, of taxes that, you know, the IMF is looking at. That's a game changer for uh, regulators if something like that is applied. It, it really is. But you need that public-private collaboration, and that's how I think we can really move the needle on some of these, you know, challenges we heard again this morning, how the m many more challenges we have to deal with. So these are some examples of ways which we can work together to, to address these. So, so thank you. All right. So I think we'll end this session. And uh, I thank all of you for uh, interesting, fascinating questions. Um, but I also want to thank the panel for the excellent presentations. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>